Hi everyone, welcome to or welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me here again today. Last week we spoke about the unsolved case of Julie Ward and that was about an unsolved case of a British woman who traveled to Kenya to take some photos of the wildebeest migration and ended up not returning home. It was also about how the Kenyan police believed that this all happened due to natural causes and based on predators in the Serengeti. However, a lot more people believe that it was a different type of predator that got hold of Julie and that's why she never returned home. But give that video a watch if you haven't, I will link it somewhere up here for you. But today we are back home in sunny South Africa and this case could basically be based off a film. And today we are talking about our very own Bonnie and Clyde. So with that being said, let's get into today's case. Intended for mature audiences only. Today we are setting the scene in the Orange Free State with the rolling hills and the dry, dusty ground beneath us. In the distance is a young infant taking its first breath and screaming as she is brought into this world. The young girl who was brought into the world on July 22nd, 1963, is Charmaine Phillips. Now, Charmaine Phillips was born to Joanna Phillips and Leo Phillips. And if we just go back to the Orange Free State for a second, I could be wrong, but I definitely think we changed the Orange Free State's name to just Free State. But anyway, back to the actual case. So Charmaine's childhood was very troublesome from the start. It definitely wasn't a place where she was loved and comforted and brought up with a lot of warmth. Charmaine had three older siblings at the time, and sadly her mom was a raging alcoholic, and her dad was diagnosed as being schizophrenic, and he would smoke copious amounts of weed and take a lot of drugs. So Charmaine and her siblings were mostly left to their own devices and to basically support themselves. When Charmaine was around seven years old, her mother did fall pregnant and did end up giving birth to twins. And the exact same year that Charmaine's mom, Joanna, gave birth to the twins, she also tried to murder her husband, Leo. And Leo did end up surviving the attack and the couple still stayed together. But you can imagine how awkward and tense things were around the house with your spouse trying to murder you and you're still living in the same house. So not only did they fight more, but there was a lot more violence in the home and there were six children living in the home, all being shown this type of lifestyle. Neighbors did notice the intense fighting around the home as well as the children having to defend themselves. So social services did end up being called and all six of the children were taken into care. And I think usually with siblings, when they are taken to foster homes or orphanages, they do try and keep the siblings together because obviously this is traumatic enough. They don't want to end up traumatizing the children more. However, because they were six children coming from one home, I don't think that many foster families were able to take on so many children at once. So sadly, all of the children were split up. So Charmaine, being a child and scared and lonely, she was petrified of living in a stranger's home and naturally she would sometimes wet the bed and sadly her foster parents took into the joyment and relentless beating of her whenever she did this. So usually a child's bed is a safe place or somewhere where they could lay their head and forget everything that happened that day but Charmaine didn't have this type of luxury. She was not able to rest her head in peace without being scared that she would wet her bed when sleeping. But then in a bizarre type of twist all six children were returned back to the care of Joanna and Leo and Joanna and Leo actually ended up having another child so now there were a total of seven children in this home and having so many kids and having to put food on the table is obviously pressure enough and this was not conducive to Joanna and Leo's relationship at all and they were fighting even more than before and remember Charmaine's mom Joanna was an alcoholic and she would often see her mom go on these binges and she would sadly also walk into her mom trying to take her own life in the bathroom or in the bedroom and she did this a couple of times and this was all before Charmaine was 10 years old but eventually Joanna had had enough of Leo's antics and he had actually heard rumors that Leo was actually touching the children, his own children, inappropriately. But even though Joanna had kicked Leo out of the house, he would constantly just walk back inside like nothing ever happened. So there was this constant inconsistency of Joanna and Leo's relationship. But then eventually Joanna did actually have enough and she moved all seven children out of their home and she moved all of them to Natal and not soon after moving here obviously Joanna had to put food on the table and she had to earn some type of income because the welfare money that she got was not enough to feed eight mouths so she would substitute the welfare money with 
being a sex worker and working at night to try and support her family. But sadly, sometimes Joanna would bring her clients back home with all of her children and Charmaine and her siblings were witness to what she had to do to earn money. Then neighbors also caught wind what Joanna was doing in the house and also with the kids being left alone throughout the entire day and social services was called again. The children were then taken away again, and sadly this would be the last time that they ever saw their mother, because a couple of years after they had been taken away and put into foster homes, Joanna was actually murdered by one of her jealous and very possessive ex-boyfriends. So Charmaine was often moved from place to place to place, and she was often left with a lot of awful people. But eventually Charmaine was done with being thrown around from foster home to foster home, and she decided that she could look after herself better, which is exactly what she tried to do. So from the age of 13, she decided she's no longer going to be a part of any foster home and she's going to now live on the streets by herself. Charmaine would try and find scraps of food wherever she could. She would also beg for food and money, but she mostly from the age of 13 worked as a sex worker as well. Eventually she would find shelter in a boat which belonged to a Lebanese sailor and this Lebanese sailor would give her food and shelter but eventually, I guess naturally, she fell pregnant. And as soon as she fell pregnant, this Lebanese sailor told her to get away, to leave him alone. And she was now left alone, pregnant with this man's baby. And I mean, it does annoy me, of course, because you know what you're doing when you do the dandy. And for him to just abandon her, especially to abandon and do these things to a child is just beyond me. But when the government found out that she was pregnant and she was underage, she was taken to a home for unwed mothers where she did have a baby and she ended up having a boy. But as soon as she had her son, he was ripped out of her arms and taken away and put into foster care. So she had no opportunity to see him at all, which I think is quite cruel. And then when Charmaine was, I guess, fit enough after she had given birth, she was then shipped off to Cape Town where she was then put in a into like a kind of naughty girl's school where there were a lot of rules, regulations, Relations and a lot of structure and of course Charmaine never having this in her life absolutely hates this and when she arrived there she only lasted less than 24 hours before she escaped and headed back to Port Elizabeth because she had heard rumors that that is where her infant son was and she wanted to be with him no matter what. Then when she got back to PE there were a couple of weeks that she was talking to the welfare services and the government and she somehow convinced the welfare services to give her back her son and so now she was a teenager, 16 years old, with an infant child on the streets once again. Not long after she got custody of her first child, did she then go back into sex work because she had to put money on the table somehow. She was 16, she had no work experience, and she had a child to care for. And not long after she was back in PE, did she actually meet another man who happened to be another sailor. But this time he wasn't Lebanese, this time he was Greek. And Charmaine actually really, really liked this man. She thought that this man was her savior and this man was going to be able to take her out of the hellhole that she was already living in. So the Greek man and Charmaine actually did end up getting married and she was married by the time she was 17 years old. But I mean, it's all in a title when she says that she's married to a Greek sailor. He is a sailor, which means that he is sailing on the sea. So Charmaine didn't really like this and she didn't like the fact that he was constantly away for weeks to months on end and I mean this is his livelihood this is how he survives and he's able to support Charmaine but Charmaine wanted to get out she wanted to go to Greece and to be away from South Africa so her husband did say that he was going to do this but he needed to earn the money to do this so he would go away for months and he did promise her okay the next time we will go to Greece it'll be fine so the next time came and he sailed off somewhere without Charmaine and her child and he left them there on the harbor in PE. So Charmaine decided, actually, screw this, I'm leaving, and she started walking down the harbor, where she actually conveniently walked into one of her exes, who then asked, you know, Charmaine, how are you doing? How's everything going? And they started talking, and eventually her ex said, you know, I'm kind of bored, let's go get some drinks, let's go smoke some weed, and they did. And when they were busy going to get drinks, her ex-boyfriend actually introduced her to a man named Peter Grundling. So like I said, by this point, Charmaine was 17 with a child. She was now at a bar drinking with her ex-boyfriend and a man named Peter Grundling. Peter was already in his 30s at the time, socializing with a 17-year-old and her ex-boyfriend. And Peter grew up in quite a stable home. He grew up on a farm around two hours outside of Joburg. And he was described mostly by his mom as a good boy. And he always did what he was told. 
But once he started to become a teenager, and especially in his late teens, he started to hang out with the wrong crowd, and he did end up getting arrested. And actually, he was on bail at the time for a weapons charge when he met Charmaine in the bar. So once Charmaine and Peter were actually introduced to each other, it was kind of love at first sight, and they had an absolute whirlwind relationship, because the same day that Peter and Charmaine met, Peter was like, oh, you know, I'm going back to Joburg, why don't we leave PE, you come with me, and we can drink and party and do everything that you want to do. And remember, Charmaine's still married to this Greek man who is probably just doing his job off on the coast somewhere, but she leaves, she takes her baby with, and off they head to Joburg. And because Charmaine and Peter were just drinking, taking drugs, and living such a reckless life in terms of with a child, her son was actually taken away. And that was the last time that she would ever see her son because he was taken away and put into foster care where he was then adopted by an Irish couple and the Irish couple then took him back to Ireland. So Peter and Charmaine obviously discussed what Charmaine's profession was before they went to Joburg together. And Peter knew that she was a sex worker and that that's how she earned her money. And Peter kind of had a brainstorm and he was like, you know, you work in this way and that's fine. But how can we capitalize on this more? So basically what they decided to do was Charmaine would lure these men in and she would get undressed and pretend to be in the act of going to give sex or whatever she was going to do. And before she was going to do everything, Peter would then come from behind and he would then rob or, or then hold the men up by gunpoint and take everything that they had. And this is what the couple did for a couple of months. And during these couple of months and weeks, no one was really harmed except obviously the people who were robbed traumatically and all of their stolen goods. But then on Christmas Eve of 1982, Charmaine gave birth to her second son and they named him Peter Key, which is kind of like small Peter, but they named their son Peter Key and this was now the son of Peter and Charmaine. So now not only did the couple have to feed each other but they also now had a young infant to feed so they ended up living in their car and they would then just travel from place to place. So Charmaine and Peter would continue to pretend to sleep with men, rob men, all with their baby a couple of meters away in their car. But then the following year, in June of 1983, Charmaine and Peter decided to find more victims and they wanted to find victims with a bit more money because the little petty money that they had was not substantial enough to feed their habits as well as to feed their child. So they went to a place called Smuggler's Inn, which brought people from all walks of life, from the wealthy to the poorer side of life, and they would all just kind of mesh at the Smuggler's Inn. And while the couple were sitting at a table in this bar, in walked a man named Gerald Mayer, who was 34 years old at the time, and he was a surfer who would come there after his surf to have a drink, and so he did on this particular day. So the surfer then walks up to the bar and Peter sees him. He then gets up and sits next to Gerald. They start having a conversation, and Peter says to Gerald, oh, you know, I have some joints back in the car. Why don't you come join us in the car and we can then take a drive and smoke some joints. So Gerald agrees and the four of them then get up and they all head to, to Charmaine and Peter's car with baby in hand. So the three of them are then smoking weed and Gerald kind of starts to get suspicious because Peter was busy driving on the main road and then all of a sudden he turned off into the middle of nowhere and a dirt road and Gerald is like hey what's happening why are you taking me off into the strange road and as soon as they pulled off into the dirt Peter and Charmaine then turned around to Gerald and said you need to give us everything you have get out of the car and basically strip and I want to see everything that you own. So Gerald absolutely refused and he's like, I'm not getting out of the car. So Peter and Charmaine then forced him out of the car. They dragged him by his ankles and they then proceeded to pat him down and take everything that he had on him. And it is kind of unclear about exactly what changed in the couple and why they became violent. But once they had taken everything that Gerald owned, like his money and everything like that, they then turned around and one of them shot Gerald point blank in the face and he obviously passed away instantly. And they then left his body in this dirt in the middle of nowhere and they then drove away where they then laid low for a couple of days. And while they were busy laying low, they noticed that Gerald's story was all over the news. So they were watching from the point of where Gerald went missing to where they were leads and then to where they found his body. And they were all witnessing this and lapping it all up. They absolutely loved it. But as they were busy celebrating and spending all of Gerald's money, they needed more. 
So sadly, they had to go out and find another victim to be able to support their habit. So the couple then left Joburg. They then headed off to Richard's Bay, where they then slept on Peter's friend's couch. But like I said, the couple would run out of money and they needed to find more money. So it was decided between the couple that Peter would go to a pub in Richard's Bay, where he would then find another victim to bring back for the promise of Charmaine. So he would basically go to the bar, promise his girlfriend's body, basically, and then he would lure the victims back in. So Peter does bring back someone to the Richards Bay house, and his name is Vernon Alexander Swart. And Vernon was 28 years old at the time. And then the next morning when everyone had slept, had lots of drugs and alcohol, on the 19th of June, 1983, Peter promised Vernon a lift. So the four of them then left Richards Bay and they then drove to a place called Malmouth. And basically when Peter was in this area, he then pulled off to a place near a couple of wattle trees where he then dragged Vernon out of the car. He tied Vernon to these trees. And just as he had previously done to Gerald, he then robbed Vernon of everything that he had. And then Charmaine shot Vernon straight point blank in the face. And basically Charmaine would say that as soon as her and Peter tied Vernon up to the trees, Charmaine almost instantly shot him in the face. And she would say this because she said that he was incredibly annoying and he was constantly babbling and whining and she just wanted to shut him up. So the couple, Charmaine and Peter, got away with around 270 Rand from Vernon, as well as a couple of personal photographs that he was carrying on his person. So the couple knew that they couldn't go back to Richards Bay and just stay there, but they did end up driving there just for the night to be able to sleep with baby Peter and then they would head off to Durban the next day, which they did. And basically on their way, they would constantly go from town to town, never staying in one place for more than 24 hours and they would continually commit crimes and robberies in order to support their habits. But then only a week later after they had just murdered Vernon, they had run out of money. So Charmaine and Peter had now left Durban and they had now headed to a place called Omelo, which was actually Peter's hometown. And in Omelo was where Peter met a man in his 30s named Baron Eugene Gravenstein. And they actually met him at a pub and Peter had promised Baron a lift, like he usually did. And he was going to take Baron from Omelo to a place called King Ross near Dam. So the four of them then hop into the car, which was Charmaine, Peter, Baron and baby Peter. But however, before leaving Omelo, Peter actually wanted to make a pit stop at a pub where he would meet up with his old school friends and they would watch a game of rugby, have a few drinks before heading off to King Ross. And Baron was apparently quite a nice guy and he said, oh, it's no problem, you do what you need to do, thanks again for the lift kind of thing. But while everyone at the pub was busy talking, it happened to come up that Baron was quite a gambler and that he would place a lot of money on sports games or horse races and this is what he liked to do. And as soon as Charmaine and Peter had heard that he would have a lot of money in his bank account and he would put it on racing or whatever, then the wheels started turning in their head and they were like, this is our perfect guy. This is going to be our next victim. So now the plan was in motion. The couple and Baron and the baby then get into the car and they then start heading off to King Ross. But now they're all driving and Peter then stops off near a dam. It's now dark. And he then tells Baron to get out of the car. The couple then pat Baron down like they have every other one of their victims. They take all the money that he has on him, but they want his pin code for the bank because they heard how much money he has. So Peter starts beating Baron and he asks for the pin code. Baron gives it to him and as soon as he does, Charmaine then shoots him in the head, point blank like she had done to everybody else, and Baron dies on the spot instantly. They then leave his body near the dam and they then drive only a kilometer away to a house that apparently belonged to Peter's friend. But when they got to the house, only a kilometer away from where they just murdered somebody, the house was absolutely pitch black. There was no one there except for the granny flat, which had a light on. So Peter walks to the granny flat near the house and it's actually the domestic worker who lived on the property. And Peter's like, oh, you, you know, I'm really good friends with so-and-so. Please, can you let us in? We have a baby. We just want to stay here for the night. And the domestic worker's obviously like, no, I, <laughs> I can't just stay too into the house. But eventually Peter persuaded her and they ended up staying in this house for the night. Then early the next morning, they did leave the house, and they then headed off to Bloemfontein, where they then withdrew all of Baron's money. Then when the couple were in Bloemfontein is when they would meet their fourth and last victim, who was named Martin Mufossi. 
Martin was 24 years old at the time, and he was the only black man with the entire murder of Charmaine and Peter. So all of Charmaine and Peter's victims previously were white men, but now this was their first person of color. So then, on the 30th of June, 1983, Martin was busy walking down a road, which was actually a whites-only road. And he was walking down this road because at the end of the road was a new suburb, and that new suburb was connected to the township where Martin lived. And I can't imagine the amount of stress that Martin must have been in walking down this whites-only road because he must have been at attention the entire time because you never know and when a car randomly then pulled up next to Martin his heart must have skipped a beat but then Peter kind of rolls down the window with Charmaine in the passenger side and he's like hey do you need a lift don't you want to get off this road we can then help you and just take you to the township but now Martin's in the car and they then proceed to drive Martin down the road but then they pull off to a secluded area where Charmaine and Peter then proceed to rob him and Charmaine and Peter then ruthlessly murdered Martin and left his body in the middle of Bloemfontein. So this entire murder spree with four victims had taken 17 days total and even though there were no eyewitnesses to the actual murders taking place there were a lot of people between each murder who had seen the couple with the people and seeing the people get in the car. So police were now aware of Charmaine and Peter. The police also put Charmaine and Peter's face on a popular crime or police show back in the 80s with a plea for any information about the couple. Now besides the actual murders, the South African media was going absolutely wild with these stories because there was this kind of romance about the Bonnie and Clyde of South Africa and this killer couple with a baby who were going around promising sex but ending up dead. These were the kind of things going around in the media and people were absolutely lapping it up. But Charmaine and Peter knew that their time was running out and they needed to make a plan. And it just so happens to be their luck that there was actually a roadblock taking place on the outskirts of Joburg in order for you to enter another province. And police had stopped them because they wanted to check for the South African Bonnie and Clyde. But they actually ended up letting them go because they couldn't confirm that this was them. So Charmaine and Peter knew that they probably weren't going to get another lucky chance like that. So they ended up driving straight to Peter's brother's house and Charmaine's sister-in-law. And as soon as Adam Grundling, Peter's brother, had opened the door, Charmaine then shoved baby Peter into Adam's face and they then shut the door and they ran for it. So Charmaine and Peter were then driving a couple of kilometers in their car where they then stopped, got out of the car, abandoned their vehicle and then saw a red Kawasaki chilling on the side of the road. Two then got onto the bike and they then stole this bike but police had witnessed the entire thing. So police were hot on their tail and a chase ensued and Charmaine and Peter were eventually arrested. Then in October of 1983, Charmaine and Peter were then put on trial and Peter and Charmaine originally pleaded not guilty to anything. But as soon as the trial started, the media was still absolutely obsessed with this case and they were besotted with how beautiful Charmaine was and how she carried herself, which if you read about what she did in her trial, I wouldn't exactly say that she's a lady poised with manners. But basically the media was obsessed because they thought that how young and beautiful she was and they were confused as to how she could be like that but also be so incredibly violent and a murderous basically apparently at that point. But in trial Charmaine was absolutely lapping up all of this attention and she was busy swearing at the judge and making hissing and cat noises during the entire trial. She also spat in reporters faces and the judge actually recommended that Charmaine be sent for psychiatric testing because he was like something's not right here and she needs to go be evaluated before we can even proceed with this trial because he wants to make sure that everything is on point and nothing comes back to bite him later. So Charmaine actually spent three months being psychiatrically evaluated and then after the three months she was found to be fine, sane and fit for trial. Then during the trial after Charmaine's tests, Peter then absolutely admitted that he had done everything and Charmaine was completely innocent. But then Charmaine piped up and she was like, no, no, it wasn't Peter, it was actually me, I did everything. And the judge, after listening to them constantly go back and forth between who was guilty and who wasn't guilty, the judge said, actually enough. And he said, you can 100% both be guilty for these murders and it's no good in you trying to save each other. Because realistically, Charmaine couldn't actually be sentenced to hang because she was under the age of 21 and Peter, being in his 30s, was of age and could be hanged. So by Charmaine admitting that she 
committed all the murders, she was trying to save Peter's life and vice versa. But the judge called Peter and Charmaine incredibly wicked and incredibly violent people and Peter Grundling was actually sentenced to death by hanging and Charmaine was sentenced to four life sentences with a total of 124 years in prison. But the judge said that he was basically this close to actually changing the law and sentencing Charmaine to death but he knew that he couldn't because she was underage but he said that if there was any leeway that would be 100% what he would have done and apparently when Charmaine first got into prison she was incredibly rough and she just wanted to get to the highest ranks of any gang in prison and she actually succeeded but then around seven years after she was first put into prison she apparently found God and there she became an upstanding prison lady. But now begs the question what happened happened to little Peter. Remember the last time we thought about him or he was spoken about was when he was just forced onto Adam, Peter's brother. So little Peter did actually have a very rough upbringing. He was constantly reminded that he was the son of murderers. He was constantly moved from foster home to foster home. His biological family didn't want him. And then when Peter was 15 was when he met his mom for the first time. And most of Peter's teenage years was very rough. He was constantly in and out of prison himself. But he eventually started to settle down once he was 21 years old. But then, on the 20th of August 2004, Charmaine Phillips was actually released from prison on parole after only serving 20 years of her 124 year sentence and she was 41 when she was released. Charmaine would then be released and almost instantaneously after being released out of prison, she was then given a job as a hairdresser at a friend of a friend's business. And Charmaine would spend around a year and a half getting closer to her son Peter, but because Peter had been alone and he was on the streets most of his teenage life, he was actually working as a sex worker and sadly he did contract HIV and AIDS and he ended up passing away alone in his home in 2006. And even though Charmaine has been released, she is very closely watched by the parole board and she will always be on some sort of strict parole conditions until the day that she passes away. But I am quite shocked that she was released so early into her sentencing. And like I always say, if she was released based on being a model citizen, what do I always say about the other men that we have spoken about on this channel? you will always be a better version of yourself where you don't have those type of stimulus or stimuli anymore. So we all know how I feel about that. But that is the case of our South African Bonnie and Clyde, Charmaine Phillips and Peter Grundling. Let me know what you think of this case down below. I hope you all have a great day further. Please stay safe out there. Thank you for all the support and I'll see you again next week. Bye.